Well, I'd like to thank uh, you, Bob, for organizing this and uh, also thank the previous speakers, Nigel and uh, Sylvia and Ira, uh, for queuing up a great day worth of um, really interesting material. I'm going to finish up with the time we have remaining talking about work on behalf of my research team, because there are others involved besides me. Uh, Seth Parker, Stephen Parsons, Christy Chapman, and Christina Gessel, you'll see work represented by them in the um, discussion that I'm going to lead. Uh, and yeah, go ahead and put questions as we go along into the chat. I'm not going to be able to see them, but I know that Bob will bring up the important ones at the end. We can talk about that. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a rough picture of me masked up at uh, at local hardware store on October 17th. And uh, Christmas starts early, apparently, here in America. What was wafting through the air that day was uh, the, the lyric to a Christmas song by Bing Crosby, um, Winter Wonderland. And it occurred to me as I heard the lyric that uh, it, it could actually form a, a pretty apt description of some of my work in Herculaneum. Um, in particular, you know, Bob, it's been since 2005, I gave the first lecture for the Herculaneum Society at Oxford. You invited me to come out. Uh, and you can see on the slide from this photo that was taken in the room that I was talking then about Herculaneum and virtual unwrapping, a term I'll use today. And that was a decade and a half ago. So yeah, it's sort of much later on, we're conspiring still, you know, how we might crack the nut on Herculaneum. Um, and I, you know, I'll be honest, I can't sit by a campfire or a fire in the hearth without thinking about the fire of Herculaneum. That's just the... Uh, occupational hazard of doing work on carbonized scrolls, I guess. But my first visit to Naples in 2005 to the library and with uh, my colleague Richard Jenko produced that passion to try to overcome the damage from the fire and see what we could do with these, with these materials. Uh, to face unafraid. Uh, yeah, I didn't really know when I started that work almost two decades ago how difficult some of it would be, and it's still possible today. I put this slide together 20 minutes ago, and I, I googled my name with stymied, and what comes up as the first result is scientist stymied in efforts to read ancient scrolls. Um, Seal says he hopes that rescanning with more powerful equipment will reveal the text. Yes, to face unafraid, and you know, just to do the science, I, I wanted to make sure that Nobody else's name is also connected to stymied. So I, I Googled your name, Bob, Bob Fowler. And, um, but what actually comes up is a baseball player, you know, who could not hit a pitcher. So that's my facing unafraid, the plans that we made, because clearly from the beginning, my plan has been and still is to read manuscripts that are rolled up and carbonized and virtually unwrap them. So the song ends with uh, walking in a winter wonderland. Uh, and, you know, you might think that winter wonderland is, in Herculaneum speak, is more like Wordsworth, this uh, wreck of the Herculaneum lore. Uh, is it really a winter wonderland or is it more like the winter of our discontent? Um, I'm going to walk us through some of the progress from my research team and, and we'll see what we think about that. Virtual unwrapping as a pipeline and an engine for discovery was something that we, uh, we put together in order to read Herculaneum. And we've identified the steps um, that you can see here in the schematic that have to do with an initial acquisition in some way, shape, or form of a piece of material like a Herculaneum scroll uh, using uh, a representation that can uh, uh, see through the entire uh, set of wraps, especially if that, if that piece of material has multiple layers or if it's rolled up. And then the subsequent steps in this pipeline represent software approaches to eventually produce at the very end something that can be an analyzed in a scholarly way, hopefully a text that can be read. And we generated this pipeline and all of the pieces of it over uh, time in terms of research. And eventually it came to the place where we were able to prove that the pipeline completely worked from start to finish on a real object. 
And that happened for us in 2015 uh, on the scroll from Engedi, which is part of the collection of the Israel Antiquities Authority in Jerusalem. And this scroll was so badly carbonized that it wasn't going to be possible to have it be physically restored. And so we were able to scan the interior structure using micro computed tomography. And what you're seeing, seeing here is all of the other stages of virtual unwrapping that we're able, we were able to use to produce what in the end was a complete reading of the seven, five to seven wraps inside this scroll. So this was a huge breakthrough for us and it inspired our ability to uh, produce scholarly texts from things that most people thought were too severely damaged. Um, hopefully leading toward applying the same thing to Herculaneum. So you see in this case, on a fragment from inside, from deeply inside that scroll, we see uh, the actual writing. Now I'm talking about this as a, a software pipeline being completely agnostic to, uh, the, uh, to the details uh, that we just heard from Ira about things like chemistry and the origins of the ink. Basically, we're just talking about sets of operations from micro tomography all the way to a completely unwrapped uh, readable text. And the pipeline works, we're um, applying more recently the same pipeline, the same approach uh, to, to new objects, uh, things that have popped up since we started this work. What you're seeing here is a manuscript from the, uh, the Morgan Library in uh, New York City. It's the Morgan 910. It's a copy of uh, the Acts of the Apostles in uh, Egyptian Coptic, uh, Greek Coptic, and it is uh, impossible to turn the pages because it's so badly damaged. And so you see here a, a slice of the tomographic scan that we completed. And the tomography now is so much more detailed. We can see every one of the choirs, the binding, and those pages, as I show you this visualization of what that tomography produces as a starting point for being able to do what we really want to do, which is apply the virtual unwrapping pipeline to be able to read the text. And here's the kind of thing that we're able to produce. Here's one of the pages from inside that manuscript. It can't be opened. Um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. Um, this work actually was presented yesterday at uh, the Cultural Heritage New Technologies Conference in Vienna uh, via Zoom. And um, my student, Christina, who is the lead author on the paper, won the Best Paper Awards. She was really, hap really happy about that. Let's get to ink, because one of the challenges of Herculaneum has always been that the ink doesn't do what we would love it to do, like the medieval inks uh, that are based on iron gall. In particular, the ink behaving in tomography is really what we're interested in because tomography is the tool that we have to use to do the first part of this pipeline, which is the acquisition. Um, when I started this work uh, a decade and a half ago, I didn't realize that the chemistry of the ink would be so important. We published it in uh, 2008 and then in 2011 as an aside really, because we didn't realize how important it would ultimately be. But the ink definitely had traces of things in it that we did not expect because we knew that the ink would be carbon-based. And the carbon ink basis of Herculaneum creates for us a huge challenge. And that challenge is that on the left, you see a photograph close up of a letter form from a fragment from Herculaneum. And on the right, you see the tomography of that fragment at very high resolution, but you can't see with the naked eye any evidence of the ink in that tomography. And that's a real problem because if tomography is going to produce for you the basis for virtual unwrapping, it has to elicit some signal that will allow you to actually see the ink as a part from the structure. We took on this challenge because we realized after having been stymied that uh, we would have to solve this issue in order to be able to apply virtual unwrapping uh, from the beginning all the way through the end of the pipeline uh, to material from Herculaneum. So I want to walk you through how we are approaching the challenge uh, of the fact that the ink at Herculaneum is, is carbon-based. And we'll start with 
some proxies that we made in the lab. On the left, what you're seeing is a uh, phantom. It is a constructed object that helps us understand how this is going to behave in tomography. So the object is constructed so that the dots are made of iron gall, and you can see those dots show up very nicely in the tomography, but the blobs, the letter forms, if you will, are made of carbon. So they don't show up very nicely or at all in the tomography. Um, we've also labeled the columns one through six because it represents roughly the thickness of the amount of carbon that's been placed on the papyrus. So one application as opposed to six applications. So let me give you some insight into our thinking. The uh, structure of papyrus and possibly with ink on papyrus, you could conceive of as looking like this with perhaps a layer on top, the layer being ink. There's relative thickness between the papyrus or the animal skin and then the ink that's applied on, on top. You may even get some penetration of that ink if it's soluble or if it was um, very wet when it was applied, it might not sit just on top, it might actually penetrate. Nevertheless, when you apply tomography, if the ink and the substrate have a very different density, think you know iron as opposed to papyrus or iron as opposed to animal skin, then you're gonna directly see in tomography a, a density difference between the layers. And if you have the right resolution, you'll be able to differentiate that directly from the scan with your eye. If on, on the other hand, you, uh, you do not have a density difference between those, those different substances, the ink that's been applied and the substrate, what you may end up seeing in the, in the tomography is, is something that just looks uniformly the same intensity or the same density. And so my conclusion when I thought about this was that the conventional wisdom meant we were at a dead end. But after thinking about it and doing some experiments where we went back to first principles, I realized that I had misunderstood what it is I needed to be looking for in this kind of data. I took some carbon black and I made some index cards with big globs of carbon on them and I scanned them so that I could see what it looked like. And it was clear that the carbon is, is not invisible. Uh, in fact, it makes a, in the case of the index card, you can see that it made a, a morphological change in the cross section. So the narrow part of this cross section is the index card alone. And the part where the carbon's globbed on there is the part where the carbon is. So you can see that the carbon is clearly visible in the scan. Uh, yeah, so what, what did I gain from this conventional wisdom, carbon not visible? Well, it's true, you can't see the carbon ink, it's really thin. Um, what, what to do? Well, some emerging, some principles emerged from our experimentation and, and a, a little bit of a deeper consideration of what we might be looking at in tomography. For one thing, you have to have a high enough resolution to be able to show evidence of something that's coated very thinly and maybe penetrating, but very thinly. Uh, another thing is that there must be some change in the shape. If the carbon's gonna create evidence of itself, maybe it's filling in some of the fibers, maybe it's actually creating a, a shape on top, maybe it's penetrated. Um, we need a method to detect, and you know what's, what's emerged in the past five years is something called deep learning. So putting all of these things together, well, it made me hungry for one thing, but um, let me just say that you have some kind of structure that the ink uh, makes some change to, and then you scan it with tomography, it might be possible to go ahead and detect that change. So think about the fibers of a papyrus fragment, and I've rendered one here, and think about those fibers and their shapes changing slightly by being coated with something like ink. And let's forget about the chemistry of the ink. Let's just think about the shape, okay? The shape of the fiber pattern is gonna change a little bit. And maybe if the ink is actually thick, the, um, there's gonna be a, a little ridge. So if we can capture the right resolution, we ought to be able to see this effect. The work that I did in Paris in 2009 created uh, scans that were pretty high resolution for the time. We had scans of scrolls that were intact at a resolution of 25 microns, which is about width of a human hair. Um, but more recently, at the Diamond Research, Diamond Light Source in Oxford, 
we have been able to capture images of the interior structure of Herculaneum material. And this is the exact same slice position of the scroll we scanned in 2009, but now scanned at eight micron resolution, which is about double the size of a spider web um, and about a third of the size of a human hair. And I mean, you can take a look and see that areas in the original scan that created ambiguity give for us in this new scan with the resolution, the ability to disambiguate that. We can follow every one of these papyrus fibers around uh, in this higher resolution. So very encouraging because this gives us maybe some handle in this emerging principle of, can we detect the carbon using tomography, uh, even though it's invisible to the naked eye. So here, here's the principle. Not being able to see the ink in the scan is not the same thing as saying that there's no evidence of the ink in the scan, okay? So the theory is there's evidence, but we need to tease it out. So we think that we've converted the problem from one of scanning to one of data science, where we're going to use data science and in particular deep learning to pull out the evidence that we can, that we can obtain from carbon ink and amplify it. So let's go back to the carbon phantom and I'll walk through how this works. Uh, I'm gonna align the phantom. So this, this is a constructed image, not a photograph. I've taken each of the columns, stripped them down and aligned them so that it aligns exactly with the tomography. Now, I don't know how this is gonna work uh, across the distances. You know, when I, I accepted the invitation to give this talk, um, I was planning on coming to London because who's not gonna do that, right? Who's not gonna take? Um, but sadly, I got up this morning and where I came was to my office. Um, and so if I go back and forth and you see this toggling on your screen and I'm not sure that you can, but you should be able to see the ink basically just disappear in the tomography, especially on the columns where there's so little carbon. Now on the far right, I'll go one more time. You should be able to see that those blobs are actually kind of evident, columns five and six, maybe watch the, um, the, the big rectangles or the blocks. They're kind of evident as a little bit of a signal on top of the fibers, uh, but you can't see anything when you get down into columns one, two, and three. Okay, well, here's the, here's the concept. Um, imagine, okay, that we have a scan, which I'm showing as a uh, sort of an unstructured green and yellow surface here. And we can line up that scan exactly with the pattern so that we know where everything should be in that scan. So even though we can't see it with our eyes, we use the pattern to line everything up. So the scan is now no longer a mystery, right? But rather because we know that it aligns, we can make a target that we know lines up with the scan and we know will tell us where the ink is and where the ink is not. This is the perfect kind of a problem for machine learning because from this target and this alignment, we can basically make these assignments. We can think of the scan as a probability distribution. Little sections of the scan form a probability of maybe there's ink or maybe there's not. And what we'd like to do is be able to take those little sections and be able to estimate whether it is or not, whether it is ink or not. So, we train a neural network, a deep learning method um, on the target to be able to generalize and answer that question. Machine learning is good at really good at, at two things, taking um, a very nonlinear set of probability estimates and representing it. And it's also really good at then generalizing from that distribution, new dis parts of the distribution that it hasn't seen before. So we're gonna go ahead and train every little section of that scan based on the target so that we can tell whether that section of the scan should be labeled as ink or no ink. And then we're gonna go ahead and train up a neural network to code all of those values together. And we're talking about millions of samples that we can get from one scan where we have evidence that there's ink or evidence that there's not ink. The neural network allows us to code up these binary labels of ink, no ink over a large number of samples and then hopefully generalize the result. So the idea is take the scan that you can't see any ink in, apply the result of the neural network, which ought to be able to go through that scan and detect 
if it's fully generalized, where the ink is, and then amplify the result by showing what the neural network thinks is and is not ink. So here's the result on the carbon phantom from having done exactly that. Okay, these are the six columns, and you can see that the first five are detected quite readily using this technique. In other words, the training of the ink no ink directly from the tomography allows us to identify these regions as ink uh, with, with no further need to do any other work. Uh, this, uh, this result's quite surprising. In fact, we consider it to be a breakthrough because uh, it actually makes visible the evidence of ink in micro CT when the ink does not have uh, serious differences in its density. Okay, this, um, this paper was published last year in PLOS 1 and you can find it at this link. Um, those results are all on a, a phantom we constructed. Um, so, you know, we, we've done this work long enough to know that you really need to get to the real material and then of course you see what's going to happen. So let me show you on the, the lunate sigma, the fragment that I, I led with. Upper left, you have the photograph. Upper right, you have the micro CT. Having trained the neural network, you can see that the machine learning, the deep learning technique amplifies quite readily that, that ink signal, allowing it to be detected now in the tomographic set. But let me go further than that. This is unpublished, will be published soon, we hope. I presented it last fall at the, uh, at the Getty. Uh, here we have a fragment about the size of your thumbnail, maybe a little bit bigger. I'm showing you the view in tomography. And the view of the top layer in tomography without any extra help doesn't reveal any ink. So we're going to do some training. On the left-hand side, we'll train. And on the right-hand side, we'll classify using the, uh, the, the convolutional neural network, the deep learning approach. And what I'm going to show you is the result of that as an animation. So you don't know where the ink is yet in your, in your uh, view of what I'm showing you right now. But I'm going to show you the training and then the classification running as a, uh, a simulation now. The alpha in white in the lower right is there so that you can estimate the scale of the letter form that you're looking for. You're looking for a letter form and it's going to be about that big. Scale is really important, right? Because we don't know from this scaleless image, you know, how big the letters should actually be if they're written on this fragment. Uh, so I'll give you that hint, but the letter you're looking for is not an alpha, so you have to guess if you can see the letter form appear on the right-hand side. Um, so you should be seeing an animation run from real data that represents our machine learning being applied to this fragment. And I'm gonna show you in thumbnail view because sometimes it becomes a little bit more apparent. Um, and I wonder if anybody be brave enough to unmute and just tell me what letter they see appearing on the right-hand side. Omega. And that is correct. Um, in thumbnail, at least what I'm looking at it, you know, it's almost more readily apparent that we're dealing with an omega there. Training with the ink on the left, which really is not coherent letter forms, but the ink on the right responds and you can see it generalized from the neural network. And there's the mask that we used to uh, train the network. All right, so we consider this to be pretty exciting because here's the pathway. Fragments that have visible text form for us an avenue, an avenue for training a neural network on Herculaneum ink. We think if that network is robust enough and captures enough of this probability distribution of what does ink look like from Herculaneum in tomography, that we could build a neural network that allows us to go after in-text scrolls. And so what we need in these emerging principles are uh, great resolution, an understanding of uh, the technique um, through machine learning or deep learning, right? And the ability to collect that data and, and start working on it. And we have collected that data. It's an active pursuit. Last fall at the Diamond Research Center, we collected two full scrolls at eight micron resolution. They look like this. Um, this is fascinating stuff. And when you take a look at these things, there's almost an artistic side to what you can see in the interior structure of a scroll. 
I'd like nothing more than to be able to read for you the text that's on the inside. If you slice this thing vertically rather than um, transactually, this is the kind of geometry that you can see. Uh, this is the winter wonderland of Herculaneum. We're poised to use data science, deep learning, to be able to try to read the ink from Herculaneum inside these scrolls. All right, I wanna finish by um, telling you that there's a surprise that kind of came out in her work. Um, I'm gonna call it the deep learning surprise because it turns out that it may be possible for us to do more than just make the ink visible. Um, it might be possible actually to make the ink look as good as a photograph. Um, if you wanna read up on this, there's a paper uh, linked on the bottom, but let me walk you through the concept because in the training of the neural network that we've been doing, we have these labels that are ink and no ink. It's a binary decision. But what if instead we got rid of those labels and we just used a photograph, okay? We use a photograph that says, well, here's what it actually looks like and here's what the tomography is. If we have enough of those samples that link up what the tomography captures and what we can see, would it be possible to render from the tomography alone, something that looks like a photograph. Well, I'm actually here to say that it is possible to build a network and we've done it with the carbon phantom and I'm gonna show you those results first. This is rendered from only the tomography, but it looks surprisingly like the photograph I showed you, right? Um, we used the photograph as the the map so that we could connect everything in the tomography to the physical appearance, the optical appearance. And then that network was able to generalize to be able to produce this result on the carbon phantom. So if I show you a triptych, basically the top layer is a photograph. The bottom row is the rendered result from the tomography alone, having leveraged the neural network, the the deep learning that comes from using the photograph and the tomography. What we think we might be able to do is give to the, uh, to the scholar something that looks more like the bottom row rather than the second row, which is this, the straight tomography, or the third row, which is our machine learning enhanced tomography. I mean, if you're interested in the scholarship, and this is a rhetorical question, but wouldn't it be nice to be working on something that looks more like a photograph and less like an x-ray? Well, we think so. And so applying this to a real object, I'm gonna go back to the Morgan 910 and I'm gonna show you that on a fragment, we applied this very technique uh, to this iron gall based manuscript. And on the left, you have the original photograph, which forms the key to train the neural network. And on the right, you have what we're able to see in the tomography. Now, in this case, the tomography does give you evidence of the ink because it's iron gall and you do see a density difference. What we're learning from Herculaneum is that you don't have to see it with the naked eye, you're still able to train. And by doing so, you're still able to amplify the ink and perhaps create something that looks photographically correct. But what I wanna show you now is the result on the right, you have the rendered result from tomography alone that could end up forming the basis of what we can provide in terms of texturing from virtual unwrapping. Looks a lot more like a photograph and perhaps a lot richer of a result than the, um, the, than the straight tomography or the textured tomography that we have been supplying from virtual unwrapping. So let me just point out a couple of the interesting things um, in the middle where the, uh, where the circle is. You see that it's really hard to detect in the tomography the, uh, the, the lighter stroke that you see clearly in the photograph in the upper left. Um, but the machine learning is able to capture that and render it. Likewise, we have some spots that look like they're nearly, because of the way tomography looks, your eye can't segment that. That, but on the right hand side, you see that there is evidence of ink in the, the visible spectrum, the RGB, if you will, as opposed to just the tomography. A couple of more examples that show that using this technique to amplify the rendered result uh, could provide, I think, a much more robust piece of scholarly work from virtually unwrapped things.
we believe that's going to be true. Okay, so the original photograph, ink from tomography alone, and then a little bit of an amplified result on the right from the neural network and then played around with to create the contrast, um, showing you that we might actually be able to go for more than just amplifying ink from Herculaneum, but we may be able to actually render even some of the visible, visible fragments that exist in a way that is more, has more contrast and more information than was previously thought. Now is the winter of our discontent. But of course, we know how that quote finishes, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is made glorious, made glorious summer by this son of, son of what? Son of deep learning? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I think maybe, maybe it's the son of the Herculaneum Society, which continues to shine on the work that we're all doing. And so I just want to conclude by saying to Bob, and the Society and the Institute, thanks for your support. I hope you've found this to be interesting. I really appreciate the support for the work. Um, I'm passionate about it.